So this morning we're going to be, well, first of all, is this volume okay? Okay. Um, so we're going to spend this morning talking about economy disadvantages. Um, most of the first half of this morning will be dedicated towards understanding the structure of the disadvantage, thinking about uniqueness, and a lot of explanation of different links. In this lecture will also talk a bit about how affirmatives will plan to respond to the economy disadvantage. And then Zahir follows me, and Z Zahir's lecture will mostly be talking about uh, the impact and impact turns to the economy. So that's kind of the, the structure of this morning. It's a lot about the economy, but that is really kind of the whole topic. So I've been a part of debate for about 20 years. I've been coaching debate for 17 years. And most of that coaching time involved coaching both high school and college topics simultaneously. Um, there are very few common themes amongst all of those topics, but the economy disadvantage is one of them. So it's popped up frequently, even on topics where you might not think that it would apply. And I'm imagining that some of you all have also read or debated an economy disadvantage. So if you have, would you please raise your hand? Okay, so for the vast, I'm assuming that for the vast majority of you that was related to water? Okay. And then maybe politics disadvantages or something like that that ended in the economy. But it is commonly one of the most common, or frequently one of the most common disadvantages, and I don't think that that will be any different this year. I would imagine most debates will evolve some version of an economy advantage or an economy disadvantage. So why is it so omnipresent? Um, one of the reasons why it's so successful and therefore very frequently read it is that it is an accessible research base. And this isn't true of all economic research. So um, you know, you can dig into economics journals that rely heavily on quantitative modeling, and for those of you that aren't yet um, familiar with those concepts, those might be difficult to access. But it is also the focus of the vast majority of benefits and criticisms of the proposals in particular on this year's topic. So you can access it through basic news searches and think tank searches as well, and we'll talk about how to research it towards the end. So if you're thinking about kind of, if you're, you know, thinking about going negative, and you want to successfully utilize the entirety of your squad to help you with this, this is one really helpful way to get squad input and buy-in and also teach novices to research because this research is not difficult to, not very difficult to do. It might, in fact, be some of the easiest research to do. It's also pop popular because of the speed of the link. So, you know, in all these CAPK debates, we've talked about the financialization of the economy. One of the um, consequences of that is that the economy can move and change at very, very rapid paces. And in some instances, uh, that can really help the negative because link arguments you can describe or win is very fast, kind of immediate effects on business decisions, the stock market, financial markets, et cetera. So the speed of it is um, almost assumed in the debate community. Um, so that is definitely advantageous for the neg. It's also useful for turns case arguments because the economy can um, intersect with basically all areas of society. So if we're talking about global warming, there's evidence that says that we need growth to solve it. If we're talking about poverty or inequality, there's evidence that says we need growth to solve it. Ocean pollution, water pollution, nuclear wars, relations with countries, all of those things, it helps to have a growing economy to make those things or solving those problems more effective. And then finally, if you treat this kind of like your core position for the season, I'm looking at you two ends, um, there are a lot of different link arguments that you can read. Um, and about 90% of today's lecture will be just dedicated towards going through, thinking through those link arguments, how they apply to particular affirmatives and how you might execute them uh, given a particular variant of the disadvantage. So in those 20 years of debate, approximately 38 topics, there are it's become clear that there are kind of two versions of this DA, or two structures of this DA. Version one is the collapse DA. So the uniqueness for this DA is that the economy will not collapse in the status quo. It's oftentimes implied that that means that it will also not collapse in the future. The link is that the plan causes that collapse. It's oftentimes implied that that collapse then influences global economies as well and that economic collapse leads to nuclear war. Implied in the impact is frequently that the, the impact evidence is describing diversionary conflicts. So when there is popular disrest, or unrest and a leader in that country needs to divert attention away from that popular unrest, they start a military crisis to do so. Version two of the disadvantage is the slow growth disadvantage. 
The uniqueness for this is that the economy is growing quickly now. The link is that the plan causes slow growth. And the impact is different. This impact argues, okay, this impact argues that slow growth um, usually has a pernicious effect on innovation or hegemony or support for the military, et cetera. So for those of you that raised your hand earlier, are, are these the two versions that you commonly saw or was one more common than the other? That's a question for the audience. Yep. I had one. Okay. One was more common. Is that a shared sentiment? Okay. Cool. Um, so I want each person individually now to take about 90 seconds to just brainstorm. Why would you want to read version one and why would you want to read version two? So what are the costs and benefits of each of the versions of this disadvantage? They're both relatively popular, at least empirically. So why would one want to choose to read one and then the other? In about 90 seconds, I'll, I'll, I'll call on a few people to, um, to, to, to discuss some of those costs and benefits. Okay, so um, what is a reason why you might, when, when choosing between writing one of these two versions, what's a reason why you might choose number one? In the back. Okay, so it has a stronger uniqueness and internal link claim. Um, so I agree with the first one of those, I might agree with the second too, but the first one, it is far easier to win in this economic climate that we are not going to go into a recession than it is to win that our growth is not slow. So there is better affirmative evidence that says that we have slow growth now. There's certainly an economic debate or a, a, a pundit debate about whether or not a recession is going to occur, but I think it's easier for the negative to win that argument. Yeah, Anna. Okay, good. So slow growth might have more, it might be more thumped. If you can win that the plan genuinely triggers a large recession, those are much more infrequent than periods of slow growth. So the empirical, empirically denied um, concern is smaller. Last one, yep. Okay, number one is faster, good. So um, it kind of fits with that benefit of the, um, the speed that was on the previous slide. Uh, and it's, I, I think, a little bit more tangible. Like what is slow, what is fast? harder to measure and there are different um, economic calculations for it, but there's actually a relatively agreed upon calculation for what constitutes a recession, two, quarter, two quarters of negative GDP um, growth. Um, so the links are relatively similar. Can anybody think of a reason that number two might be more beneficial than number one? Yes. Perfect, the link threshold is smaller for version two. It's far easier to read a card that says, you know, this has a negative economic repercussion, and that's a link to version two, but the link threshold for version one requires a much higher magnitude. It has to cause, cause an economic collapse, which on topics like the water topic seemed kind of difficult to believe. It may be easier on this year's topic to believe that given the kind of drastic changes that are necessary to, cons to institute a UBI or a jobs guarantee. Yep. Okay, good, it no links DDEV. A problem with version one is that you have to spot the affirmative. Well, you have to, you, you have to spot the affirmative a link to DDEV. Um, DDEV will be coming in an hour and a half. If you don't know what that is, just maybe mark a quick star or circle on your lecture flow. 
Um, number two doesn't. Number two probably spots the link to hedge bad, but I think that that's maybe, you know, your neg and you can win hedge is good. Last one. Okay, that's such a good connection, okay? So number one does not or number one requires two things. One, that the United States is key to the global economy, which I, I think that, that argument is defensible. But as a component of that, you also have to win that there is global growth now. So the global element of, of the first one kind of adds some moving pieces that is not present in version two. And there is almost always a new article, you know, if you just Googled this, that says that the Chinese economy is going to collapse, the Russian economy is going to collapse, South American economies are going to collapse. And those might all thump or take out or non-unique version one, but they have basically no effect on version two. Really good. So despite the fact that we know a lot about this disadvantage already and we've seen it on previous topics, this year is different. And there are a few reasons why this year debating this is going to be different. First, there is a lot more depth in the literature. So I, I judged a lot of debates on the water topic, and the debates really hinged on one or two link cards and kind of a non-responsive affirmative set of evidence. This year is far different. If you just kind of think about that, how these affirmatives are um, described in pop culture, um, you have uh, someone defending a federal jobs guarantee that says that it is the only way to save the United States economy. It saves capitalism. You have a negative set of evidence that says that basically it's the opposite, that it would collapse the economy in a strong line by line back and forth in the literature. That's great for teaching debate, I think. It's also great for depth of, you know, you will be rewarded for the deeper that you get in your research on this. The second difference is that we just had a recent recession. So we definitionally had a recession during COVID. That changes things a little bit because the, the ability to win version one of the DA is a little bit harder now because of that recession. I guess the version two is also a little bit more difficult, but it's something that ought to be considered both on the affirmative and negative when constructing um, your economic related positions. Uh, the recession was short. In fact, I believe it was the shortest in American history. The response from the government was relatively effective. Um, and it was because of COVID, not, which is uh, far more unpredictable than something, um, we didn't see it coming. So, so there's kind of maybe some answers to this that you could embed in um, your negative position or your affirmative argument. Third, something econ related is likely to be an affirmative advantage. And this is huge, okay? Um, this means that what I just described on the previous page, version one and version two, might not actually be that common this year because you might not be reading the economy DA as a separate off-case position. We're gonna talk about that in the future, but just recommend, or recognize how different that makes the debate. And then finally, the links are manifold, and you can win links based on the mechanism, meaning fiscal redistribution, tax and transfer. You can win a link based on the result, meaning how it thinks we ought to structure the economy. And you can win links based on area, meaning all of the subcomponents of affirmatives that fit in each area. So now kind of begins the part of the lecture that we're going to start talking about links. So, if, you know, depending on if you're a 2N or a 2A, what I would be thinking about now kind of throughout this lecture is when you are writing your economy DA or when you are preparing for debates, which one of these link arguments do you think is most persuasive and how will you be com comparing these link arguments to each other? So, for example, an affirmative might hurt business confidence but might help consumer confidence. Your job is to win that, you know, depending on which side you are, your issue matters more than the other one. Okay, so here's the structure. We're gonna talk about mechanism links. So this will largely about, be about taxes, deficit spending, and transfers. We're gonna talk about results-based links. So, um, you know, if the affirmative says that they solve unions, we'll talk about why that may, might be arguably bad for the economy or bad for parts of the economy. If the affirmative says that they solve inequality, we'll read a card that says it's actually good to have inequality for the economy. We're gonna talk about area and more niche affirmatives. So we'll talk about how Medicare for all, carbon tax, et cetera, um, have link arguments. Then we'll have execution tips and research tips. 
I just kind of want to unpack for a second why it's structured this way. So mechanism and result. I, I mentally conceptualize them this way because mechanism-based link arguments are helpful for counterplans. So if you have a, a mechanism-based link that's like, we should not be deficit spending, or we should not be taxing, or maybe we should not be spending at all, then you can construct advantage counterplans or counterplans with link differentials based on those links. That's not really as true for the results area links, which are more about basically if the affirmative solves something, you're impact turning that thing. So most of these first link arguments that we're going to talk about would pair very well with a pick or an advantage counterplan. So the first set of link arguments related to mechanism are about taxes. I'm not terribly interested in relitigating the question of whether or not fiscal redistribution requires tax and transfer. I think it is likely that some affirmatives will choose to tax this year, but we'll talk a little bit about both taxes and uh, deficit spending as mechanisms for affirmatives. So the first of these is the tax certainty disadvantage, or tax certainty link. The premise of this argument is that our tax system very rarely changes. So the IRS does change taxes yearly because they are accounting for inflation when they change some percentages. But as a major tax changes in the United States are big congressional endeavors that are very rare. They might know the last time that the United States made major changes to the tax code. Yeah. Uh, no, that was one. But 2017, the uh, Trump tax cuts, uh, which I think were called the American Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, made substantial changes to the United States tax system. It actually, um, but importantly for negative link arguments, for the most part, it did things to reduce tax rates. So in doing so, there are arguments that that made taxes actually more predictable. P companies and people thought that they were going to be subjected to lower taxes than more. So this tax certainty argument basically says that it is good to have a predictable and stable tax system. And when we do changes to that, in particular increases to that, every, since everyone is subjected to taxes, everyone feels a bit less confident. Less confident that their paycheck will be as large as they think it will be for corporations less certain that they will be fiscally solvent in that year and able to um, sufficiently you know, supply their goods and pay their workers, et cetera. So this is kind of like the business confidence link. If you increase taxes in one area, it's possible people that are subjected to taxes will also think that their taxes will increase. And we'll read a card about that in a second. The second deals with offshoring. This literature is actually quite robust given that one of the primary defenses and results of the American, of the Trump tax cuts was that companies began to onshore. So it lowered the corporate tax rate. Uh, well, if you think about, you know, some companies are motivated uh, to move overseas to find the lowest tax rate, basically to see havens for taxes. So one benefit of the Trump tax cuts is that they cause more onshoring. There are significant drawbacks, but that's a pretty good one in terms of restor restoring American manufacturing and making sure a large amount of the supply of goods that are necessary for, necessary for Americans are actually produced here. So a higher corporate tax rate might reverse those Trump tax cuts in a way that encourages offshoring, meaning companies moving overseas, and discourages onshoring, which means companies coming back to the United States that maybe previously left. The third tax-related link argument that you ought to be aware of is just the payroll tax link. So um, Mr. Forslund yesterday gave what I thought was a, a brilliant and informative lecture about Social Security. Uh, there was tons of information there. If you found it to be complex, I really recommend that you try to find a recording and go back and listen to it again because what was said in that will, will basically encapsulate the Social Security area of the topic. One element of Social Security that you all ought to remember is that Social Security is funded through payroll taxes. What that means is um, when you, you or your family members get a paycheck and you are um, a, a, a percentage of that is taken out to go towards Social Security. I believe that percentage is about 13%. 6.5% of that or so is paid by the employer and 6.5% of that or so is paid by the employee. So if I make, you know, if, if I make $100 for working however long period of time, $13 of that will be, or no, $6.5 of that will be taken out, and then $6.5 more dollars will be paid by the employer into the uh, Social Security fund. There are other funding mechanisms that fund into Social Security, but this is the, this is the primary one. 
So if an AF increases the number of benefits given, so maybe includes a broader subset of people, or includes a particular care mechanism, or maybe incorporates Medicare into Social Security, that would dramatically, it, well, depending on the size of the affirmative, it would increase payroll taxes. Okay, so what that means is more money coming out of your paycheck and employers paying more money out of their coffers as well. And some businesses can handle that. I think Amazon, given that they're spending hundreds of billions of dollars uh, or hundreds of millions of dollars trying to fight unions, I think they have enough money to pay this. But small businesses might face a little bit more difficulty in doing so. So a dramatic increase in a payroll tax might cause small businesses to do other things, raise prices for consumers, provide fewer benefits to workers, lower wages to workers, all of which have negative economic effects. So this payroll tax argument, I think, will mostly be related to the social security area of the topic. The final tax-related link arguments that I want you to consider, and we'll talk a little bit more about later, are just the specific taxes that one might, that an affirmative might introduce. So we have a Green New Deal affirmative here that is funded through a wealth tax, which is a very, very dramatic change in the way that the United States tax system is currently designed. In wave one, we're going to have an affirmative that imposes a carbon tax. So imposes um, at entry ports uh, where we are importing goods and at major mines or wells in the United States, basically imposes a, ta a tax on the production of fossil fuels. And there are other variants of that, like the natural resource and universal property taxes uh, that kind of fall under the same thing. So it's helpful not just to think about your taxes link arguments as being generic taxes, but to think through corporate, individual, payroll, wealth, carbon, universal, et cetera. And by the time you get to you know, your first tournament of the year, be it um, you know, Green Hill or Washburn Rural, you're likely to want to have a much broader set of link arguments than just taxes in general. So I'll give you a second to read this card, which I think kind of describes the tax certainty link argument that I described earlier. Pretty generic. Well, it's very generic, uh, but the, the basic thesis of the argument is that individuals, corporations, governments, it's helpful for them to all know basically what to know and project what the likely tax out tax structure is going to be. And the more that that ha changes, the more introduce, introduced uncertainty, and the less likely it is that people are likely to make ex economically efficient decisions and to choose to stay in that country. Whoa. Okay, second mechanism links, uh, second set of mechanism links are related to deficit spending. So we have an AF, the Federal Jobs Guarantee AF, that is not the Green New Deal one, that the Solvency Advocate is relatively clear that this ought be funded through deficit spending. The, one of the juniors lab is, pro is producing a Federal Jobs Guarantee, I uh, actually don't know what area, but an M modern monetary theory affirmative, either um, UBI or Jobs Guarantee, and those are committed to deficit spending as their mechanism. And deficit spending, um, will you'll have other link arguments that you can read to this. You obviously, in this case, would probably not want to read the set of link arguments on the previous page about taxes. But you can argue that deficit spending is bad for the economy as well. There are several ways that authors do this. So there's one set of actually pretty qualified economic literature that just basically says that when the government spends money, they are, they are trading off with private sector efficiency and productivity. So if, the, you know, if, it's, the, if it's the government spending money on a particular project, let's think the jobs guarantee affirmative. Uh, if it's the government that's doing an infrastructure project, for example, there's economic literature that argues that the government will be um, corrupt and bloated and pay f uh, inefficiently and construct a bad project. But the private sector, you just left it up to them to pay for it or to contract them to do it, they would do it much better. 
The second style of link argument versus deficit spending and deficits in general is called debt multiplication. It's basically the idea that if you, this is, um, I don't really love the household metaphor in, with regards to deficits, but we'll use it here. The idea is basically like, if you take a loan out for $50,000 to go to college, then the longer that you, the larger that that is, and the longer that you hold it, the more interest you're going to have to pay in the future. Okay, so if you take a $50,000 loan, you're gonna pay, you know, X percentage of dollars on that. If you take a $100,000 loan, you're gonna take 2X percentage loan on that, and the longer that you hold on to it, the more you're going to have to pay in the future. And in some senses, that's not really that different than the way that the government borrows money. We pay interest to, what well, we sell bonds to countries that provide us revenue, or basically money, to spend, and in doing so, we have to pay interest on that. So the larger the deficit spending that we have, the more that we have debt. How does our government respond to that? Well, one way that they respond is by cutting other programs. So an uh, extremely, extremely large deficit means that we're likely to, to roll back programs that are um, like defense, even some entitlement funding could be at risk in the future. So the argument is basically like a larger debt causes the government to roll back initiatives, and those other programs are good. There's strong evidence that says that we should avoid pu public debt in the United States to prevent having to cut the military in the future. So this kind of acts as a, 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 a hedge-related growth impact. There are two other kind of international ramifications to large deficits. One is other countries will question the viability of us repaying our debt. The impact of this, mostly in debate, deals with the dollar, so a lost confidence in the dollar, um, people no longer to choose, choosing to trade their goods in the dollar or pin their currencies to the dollar. Because the dollar is supposed to be a currency that is backed with the full faith of the federal government. But if we, are, if we look as if we actually are unable to pay back our debts, then we are, it no longer has full faith. So other countries might choose to distance themselves from the dollar. And finally, um, if we are deeply in debt, we are also at the whims of foreign actors that are financing our debt. Does anybody know the two countries that have the highest financing of the United States debt? China's one of them. Japan, yeah, nice work. Did you both know that? Oh, I told you, okay. Secrets. Uh, so China and Japan. So um, there is a set of economic literature that basically says that the larger our debt is, the more likely China can hold us hostage in important geopolitical situations because they control large segments of the United States economy. This evidence was very, very good in the late, late 2010s, but in the last five years or so, China has actually reduced its purchasing of United States debt, and Japan has increased its purchasing of United States debt. I'll give you a, a couple minutes to read this card. This card kind of, I hope, kind of demonstrates the public-private trade-off argument, which was the first bullet point on the previous page. So an affirmative that pairs together taxes and spending probably doesn't increase the size of the government so much. This card argues you know, the opposite, that the app is a, basically an injection of new public dollars into the economy, which erodes the productive value of the dollar, creates dead weight loss, there are administrative costs associated with it, and undermines private sector productivity. Okay. <clears throat> So those are the most likely mechanisms that affirmatives will choose. So taxes, deficit spending, transfers. I think it's pretty hard to not have to be one of those things. Teams will try, but I think they might fail. And that first set, so we've, what we've just talked about, I think you need to categorize in your mind as very helpful for advantage, counterplan, and pick. This set of link arguments that we're going to talk about 
for the most part, assume that the affirmative has solved the thing that they want to solve. So they solved inequality. They solved wage stagnation. They solved bargaining power for workers. They solved unions. They solved, um, they promoted consumption-oriented growth, et cetera. And this is just saying that solving those things is bad. Uh, I would say that this, in some ways, can draw from, I mean, despite the fact that these are very different, some of these are going to draw from, like, the more deplorable literature bases, like those of you that, you know, have read The Big Myth or seen anything by Naomi Oreskes lately knows that a lot of these link arguments are going to be from people that are basically just corporate shills. But it's also kind of interesting because some of these are going to be from um, very, very kind of critically leaning sources as well. So these link arguments are also represented in things like the Fraser chapter that is in the CAPK link. So the first set of results-oriented impact turn or link is inequality is good. I think this is very, very difficult to defend, but there are people that try to do so. The basic premise of the argument is that inequality, based on the theory of trickle-down economics, helps fix absolute poverty. So it, as long as more net productivity occurs in the economy, the people at the lower rungs will inevitably be helped out. On face, this seems very, very difficult to defend, especially when looking at American society today. But there are people that do it, and I'll show you a card in a second uh, that I think does it poorly, but still tries. The other kind of bent to the inequality good literature basically just defends that it is very good to have extreme wealth in society, because then everyone will strive to be like that. And they will make economically productive decisions, and basically it will help the overall growth of the economy. So as long as we have a Jeff Bezos out there, and he's all of our idols, then we will try to be like him and produce wealth in the economy. It's kind of hard to say this with a straight face, but I'm basically saying it for you because I think it will exist. And if you haven't thought about it, it's going to catch you off guard. Second is worker productivity. So a theme of a lot of affirmatives thus far this year is that you know, it's, it's helpful to provide people a social safety net that's reliable. And it is possible that one pernicious effect of that is that people will, it, for example, if they get a universal basic income, it is less maybe likely that some people in society will choose not to work. Now, the affirmative would argue that that's probably good. Like if someone chooses not to work, that's maybe because they need to provide care for someone in their family or... Um, they have some other non-work-related passion that they ought to be able to pursue. But if you're kind of drawing from the big myth literature, this would say, well, as if you have a universal basic income, really what you're going to do is smoke weed and play video games. And that's going to be the thing that you choose to do with the rest of your life. The third set is safety net stripping. So in both the politics disadvantage that will be coming out in the next couple of days, and in the capitalism critique, there is a set of evidence that says that if we were to institute a basic income or a job guarantee, one result of that would be that the government would choose to strip other benefits. So to basically collapse what currently exists as our social safety net. And there's this weird thing going on in Washington, D.C. right now where, like, there's this, you know, this, like, J.D. Vance and Elizabeth Warren are, like, kicking it together, thinking that we can de design a progressive new economic system. And the reason why Republicans are largely on board for it is that they think that it is a way to roll back a lot of existing safety net mechanisms. I'm mentioning this here. I, I don't think that this kind of constitutes economic disadvantage quite so much. But these arguments are helpful for case turns. But it's also totally possible that you could write a disadvantage around this concept that gets to an external impact. So for example, let's say universal basic income is instituted. In order to achieve that and get Republicans on board for it, they have to basically strip the rest of the welfare state. One thing that that would do is it would undermine SNAP benefits. Um, food stamps, food support. Um, and there is very good evidence that says that that is a lifeline for American farmers, for rural economies, and for the United States agricultural system. 
So you could craft the disadvantage to basically be a case turn, but it is possible to get to external impacts that are less related to the economy, and I think SNAP might, might be the most fruitful area for research on that question. I don't really want to talk much about consumption-oriented growth bad, but it is a link argument that uh, there are a couple of economists that are kind of committed to. And then finally, I want to talk about, I guess, probably the most deplorable elements of these links, which are basically the arg set of arguments, well, it's not totally deplorable. It's just, it depends on your perspective, okay? So there is a perspective, and I think most affirmative authors are taking the perspective that, like, people, like normal, everyday people in the United States would be helped by the things that the affirmative is asked to do. It's pretty reasonable. But the contrary literature takes the perspective, for the most part, that what is good for the worker is bad for the boss. So the federal job guarantee affirmative has an internal link about labor mobility. The idea is that if you know that you have a backup job available and you can work for the federal government, you are more likely or more willing to leave the job that you're in. So if you're being treated poorly, you're harassed, you're paid poorly, you don't enjoy the work that you're doing, in the status quo, you're stuck. After the AF, you're not. That seems like such a good idea, especially for those of you that will be entering the labor force soon. But businesses don't necessarily love that. So this concept, so the, the, the concept is basically called job lock, the idea that you are locked into the job that you currently have. Affirmatives are intentionally trying to reduce job lock. Good for workers, but for the audience, why might that be bad for businesses and business owners? Yep. Okay, so they have to respond with higher wages and higher benefits in order to encourage their workers to stay. Yep. Right, so it raises the floor for what they have to do. Maybe that's a higher wage, maybe that's higher benefits. Maybe it's giving weekends off or evenings off, something that they don't do now, but a federal job, job might do. And while those things are all totally reasonable and probably increases their worker satisfaction, they probably do hurt the, well, there is evidence that says that it might hurt the corporate bottom line. So one other element of this is job, one, thing, one drawback to labor mobility is job training. So imagine yourself as a business owner, you have 20 employees, and you are consistently losing two or three of them every year to the federal government. That's tough, because now you have to rehire, you have to retrain, just to get back to kind of like baseline efficiency that existed prior to that job guarantee. So to recap, this is results because the affirmative said it's good to have labor mobility. You don't really have to win a link that the plan introduces labor mobility. They've done that for you. You can impact turn it, impact turn that link, by saying, for corporations, labor mobility is actually pretty bad. Same thing with wage, wage stagnation and unions. So, you know, the Federal Jobs Guarantee Affirmative argues that the plan would boost private sector wages by making the labor market more competitive. Those wages, what is the, the effect of those is that corporations have to make some choices. Maybe they at least publicly say that they are going to fire some people if they have to increase wages. They might have to increase the cost of goods that will be passed on to consumers. And large increase in, in wages might trigger inflation through, what's, um, through the wage price spiral, which we'll talk about in a second. And same thing with unions, which you all have now seen in the starter packet stuff. So these things, just to be clear, not very good with advantage counter plans, because if your advantage counter plan solves the advantage, you don't want to be reading a bunch of links that are turning that advantage. Those are not net benefits to your counter plan. These are largely derived, well, most of these are derived from the business person's perspective. So the business owner, the shareholder, et cetera, not necessarily the worker. Um, and this draws from what I will call the big myth, which we'll talk about at the end of the lecture. Okay, so this is a card that was produced in the Georgetown uh, Econ DA uh, in their starter packet that says that inequality is good. I think the card is bad. The purpose is to demonstrate that this argument exists. Okay, the third section of 
link discussion will be about particular affirmatives. So this isn't really about the mechanism or the result. It's about the, some affirmative proposals that are either in our starter packet, our wave one, or have been produced at other camps. The first is a carbon tax. I think carbon tax is going to be somewhat popular this year if the T argument that the plan must tax holds sway because it is one of the few areas that has a strong defense of le linking the tax to a particular spending area. So I would consider, if you're going for the econ DA, how you would want to read your links. The first one is just the fossil fuel industry. By design, a carbon tax is terrible for it. For um, places like Wyoming that get a lot of their public revenue off of oil and West Virginia, they get a lot of their public revenue out of um, coal, it would drastically change the economy in those states, Texas as well. I believe that JP and JP's research group is working on a natural gas DA, that this is partially that premise, that we ought to have a strong and robust natural gas sector in the United States, and a carbon tax or a Green New Deal would hurt that. There's also um, consumer cost and consumer confidence effects from a carbon tax. So by design, a carbon tax increases the cost of fossil fuel intensive goods. So if you go to the store and you buy milk that was produced, you know, hundreds and, or thousands of miles away using heavy fossil fuel inputs, that milk is going to be more expensive. If you have a gas-powered car, your gasoline is going to be more expensive. And finally is the trade disadvantage. And this is a little bit in the weeds, but when the United States, if the United States were to impose a carbon tax, it would be accompanied with a border adjustment, meaning that goods that were imported from other countries not subjected to a carbon tax or equivalent measure would be subjected to a tariff. So goods from China or Indonesia, for example, that right now we import at a very cheap rate because in some ways they rely on unfair labor would be much, much more expensive because they don't have the environmental regulations in place, so our levy would be imposed on them. Um, Avi is doing, I don't know where Avi is, is doing some great work trying to find link arguments that that would disrupt global trade, and the evidence that he's found thus far is fantastic. I think that the disadvantage is very strong. Next is Medicare for All. Uh, so Mr. Ellis's uh, group is producing this affirmative, and this was also produced as an affirmative at the Georgetown Starter Packet. This is also listed in the NFHS's, the National Federation of High Schools, um, novice case list. I think it has some topicality concerns, but I think it's going to be pretty popular. Um, the economic drawback of, well, there are a lot of economic debates about Medicare for All, but we had an entire college topic on this six years ago now, five, five or six years ago now. Um, and the econ disadvantage was the most prominent negative argument, and the link argument was basically that the plan, by creating a public health insurance system, would immediately put the entire private health insurance, insurance system out of business. So hundreds of thousands of workers, millions of dollars, and a huge economic shock. And all of those companies, I, get, I actually don't know if all of them are, the vast majority of them are publicly owned, so they're on the stock market, their net valuation, the second that the plan passes, would be zero. Okay? So it would have a huge immediate economic shock in hurting the private health insurance industry. Now that industry carries a ton of dead weight, it is inefficient, and it's very unpopular. So like, that might be, in the long term, pretty good to do so, and that's the affirmative proposal, but the negative won a lot of debates on that topic by winning that the link was fast and big and complicated financial markets in a way that was so much faster than the affirmative's advantages. <clears throat> the third is social security and payroll taxes, which I've already discussed. And then finally, that I, one thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of specific proposals is um, MMT, so modern monetary theory. Raise your hand if you're in the Bunton MMT research group. All right, so I'm gonna call on one of you all to just describe to us what MMT is. It doesn't have to be you all, actually. Does anybody want to talk about what MMT is? Peninsula, you've been just like obsessed with this for days. Okay, Arthur. Okay, 
Yeah, there's a lot to that. Um, good answer. Well done. You've been reading your MMT. Um, you know, the, the central premise behind MMT is that the United States is a, a sovereign currency creator, which means that we can print money at will. So the idea of a deficit is not necessarily something that we ought to be concerned about because we could tomorrow print a trillion dollar coin and our deficit would be gone because we would have that currency available. Okay? There are several other elements of MMT theory, but that's kind of like its central premise. Um, anal like an analogy that they like to draw from is that a government like the United States is not like a household. You do have to balance your finances and it's potentially dangerous for you to have a lot of debt because you can go bankrupt and not be able to pay it back. You can go to jail or face significant penalties for not paying your debt, but that's not true of a sovereign currency creator. So there will be apps that claim to be MMT or to be consistent with MMT. Um, there are a lot of things that are really appealing about this concept, and I find the people that write about it to be very, very smart and interesting. Um, but one concern about MMT is that in kind of the modern political economy, it's very difficult to conceptualize a couple of things. So one, even if we don't care about debt anymore, other people might care about our debt. So for example, remember the stuff about China and um, you know the, the cuts to other programs inside of the United States? Sure, the United States could run a really large debt, but I, don't, I think that a really large debt might still convince Marco Rubio and other Republicans in the Senate to cut our military. It might also con convince China that they have more leverage over us, et cetera. So um, that is one concern. Other, the other my kind of like obvious concern in the United States is that we have a debt ceiling. So we are not allowed to spend that much without consistently Congress raising the debt ceiling, which we've seen over and over again is a huge fight that poses significant risk to the economy. The people that are criticizing MMT, their main beef is inflation. So they say that um, you know, if you basically introduce large amounts of money into the economy to stimulate demand, prices will rise. MMT's usual response to that, MMT economics, economics, economists say, well, fine, then we just raise taxes to limit that inflation. The problem with that kind of in practice is that our Congress does not uh, respond quickly and effectively to changes in the economy. So if we have widesp widespread runaway inflation because of an embrace of MMT, MMT economists think that we can just fix that with taxes. It's difficult, I believe, to think that our Congress is just going to be willing to raise and lower taxes when it is economically most productive to do so, because their concerns are not always economic. And if they have to raise taxes, that's a difficult prospect for a lot of people that are seeking re-election. So MMT, cool economic concept. I love that we're writing an app about it. But the DA links are really, really strong because the inflation link is strong. And the way that the MMT economists respond to that link is kind of hopeful instead of practical. OK, uh, well, I, I don't know if you all have the Georgetown files yet, but I've now referenced like four Georgetown cards here and the Econ DA a couple of times. This is the whole starter packet if you want it. Um, so you can snag it. Uh, you will not be able to read these cards in debates at this camp. So if you like practice debates this afternoon, don't be reading cards from here. But hopefully this can give you a little bit of idea about what's going on at other places. So this starter packet has the Medicare for all affirmative and negative in it. It also has a pretty robust econ DA um, that I believe is kind of the best econ DA that has currently been produced. But I would imagine that Mr. Forslund is going to give them a run for their money. Okay, so let's shift now for a second from links to execution and research. So, you know, the, this is all kind of like building up for you to be able to successfully research and produce a file, but then you have to be able to effectively execute it. So, when you're neg, what can you do to win this argument more frequently? And that, what do you need to account for and how do you do it? First, you have to win uniqueness. And I know that this is like obvious, it's you're going for a DA, you need to win it. But I would say that that will be far more difficult on this year's topic, basically for two reasons. One is that affirmatives will have a lot of built-in kind of decline inevitable or decline coming warrants. And there is a 
pretty robust set of evidence right now that says that the United States may enter a recession in 2013 or 2023 or 2024. One thing that I've seen debaters at this camp struggling with so far is Mr. Hearn's federal jobs guarantee affirmative includes an advantage that says that there are basically inevitable recessions. And shout out Hearn, like I think that this is I think he's one of the best affirmative writers in the country, and this is a very, very smartly written advantage. The, uh, and it's hard for the negative to refute that claim by just winning economy high now or a short-term uniqueness trend. Because this argument is making basically a theoretical claim about the cyclical nature of the economy. It's tough, tough to refute, and you need kind of evidence to do so. I think when you are beginning to do your econ research, you'll likely cut some econ high now cards that are very much snapshots, like this is our current GDP, this is our current growth rate, and that's great, but it will also be very helpful for you to have cards that make long-term projections about the stability of the economy looking out two, three, four, five years. Second, speed is key. Uh, for those of you that are, it, Invested in the CAPK, this is a, a, a place where policy debaters draw from a lot of your knowledge. So we know a lot about the financialization of the economy. We've moved from a real economy of productions of goods and services, at least partially, to a financial economy. And a large segment of the real economy is represented in financialization. And that makes the speed of disadvantages very fast. So I mentioned that Medicare for All affirmative, that basically the second that the plan passes, private health insurance has no value in the United States, the effect on the stock market tomorrow, if that plan were introduced, would be enormous and negative. A lot of wealth lost basically in minutes. That's helpful for the negative because if you can win speed, a lot of affirmative advantages are very structural and long-term and it's always helpful to have a faster impact for both winning just time frame period, but also winning turns case arguments. It's a lot harder for us to do things like promote democracy or solve poverty or solve warming if we have a significant recession or depression in the United States. Third, you need to have link or internal link evidence that is a strong defense of why your issue matters most to the economy. I would imagine a lot of debates are going to go down like the AF improves wages but it hurts business confidence. And if you're judging that debate, you're like, what the hell do I do? Because each of you have one explanation for why the affirmative hurts the economy and why it helps the economy. And it's tough, especially in a five minute speech, to make strong comparisons between those two things. So what you want to do is to, in the debate, have very strong internal link evidence about why that issue, on the negative, it'll probably be business confidence or small businesses, why that matters more to the economy than whatever the affirmatives is. Third, you gotta be on top of what the threshold for the impact is. So if we think back to slide number two and three, when we were talking about different versions of the DA, they have different thresholds for links. If you have a piece of evidence, well, it, and this, this relies on basically evidence reading and evidence comparison. So does your card actually say that it will collapse the economy or promote a recession? Or does it just say that it will have some negative economic effect? And whatever your link argument is, see if you can make your internal link and impact match that threshold. So if your link card is like, this would take our GDP from 3.2% growth to 2.8% growth. That is not a recession. So don't read an impact card about a recession. Instead, read an impact card about slow growth, because that does represent a slowing of growth. So figure out what the threshold for your link card is and match it to your impact. And fin the final execution tip deals with how you want to handle this when the affirmative has read an economy advantage. And this admittedly will be different for a lot of you. I saw very few economy disadvantage or economy advantages the last two years. And there's kind of this cult in debate where it's like you have to have an external impact. You have to have an external impact. You don't. You can just turn theirs and turn it well. And in fact, there are huge strategic upsides for doing so. 
So if the app has read an econ advantage, the first thing that you ought to consider is that they are dramatically constrained in how they can respond to your econ disadvantage. In what ways? What, why, is, why is that true? Yeah. Perfect. They can't read impact defense. Every 2A wants to read impact defense to every disadvantage in the debate. They can't, because they read the impact in the 1AC. Yep. Okay, well, they can't, they, they can't read, like, alternate causes or empirically denied. So if you're a, an affirmative team reading an econ impact, you can't say, well, we just had a recession. And you can't say, the Chinese economy is going to take down the global economy. So you're constrained on the affirmative for making those responses. And in some ways, that should be, like, a really helpful thing for negatives because it makes what affirmative responses can be far more predictable. <clears throat> so first, affirmatives are constrained. Second, Impact calculus dramatically changes. Okay, so if you have a democracy impact and they have an economy impact, most impact calculus is trying to compare the two of those things. So one is faster, one solves everything, one you know only accesses the Russia war, etc. But if they have an econ advantage, you're talking about the same impact. Okay, so this is, it's different. And my two pieces of advice are, don't do impact calc the same way. So don't start with like economic decline turns and outweighs everything else. It's the biggest impact in the debate. It accesses these conflicts because they've agreed with that already. So do it differently, but still draw important distinctions. So you still need impact calculus, okay? But it just looks different. So your impact calculus can look like our internal link is faster than theirs. You can still say economic decline turns all of the other impacts in the debate. So you still want to say, like, you know, if they have three advantages, econ, warming, and hedge, you want to say economic decline turns warming and turns hedge, so you only have to win your turn to win the debate. It's just, it's different, in some ways easier, in some ways harder. And the final piece of advice is that I said that there's this cult in debate. I'm actually not totally sure it's a cult. It makes some sense. But you have to inoculate that judge's belief that you have to have an external impact, okay? And the way that you can do that is to say, we're conceding economic decline is the biggest impact. We both agree it's the only thing that matters. Everything else has impact defense. So when you're making your decision, you have to look at the econ debate first, okay? So it doesn't matter if it's external or not. The judge is going to start there if you kind of win your instruction that they ought to do so. When you're debating this advantage, make sure that you understand what each of their links are. Okay, so if you're neg and you want to go for the econ turn versus their advantage, I might start the 1AC cross X by saying, can you describe which, you know, can you describe each of the specific internal links that you have in the 1AC for why you help the economy and why they are key to the economy? That will, it sounds like you're just giving the app some extra speech time, but it's actually going to help you identify what their link turn is going to be versus your DA. And it's going to help you identify <coughs> whether or not they actually have evidence that says that that thing is important to the overall economy. Maybe you can just like do this on your own when you've read the advantage, but it's kind of helpful to hear them describe it. So later in the debate, in the 2AR, they can't be like, aha, you dropped our something uh, that's key to the economy. Final thing uh, related to execution. There's a little bit of judge psychology uh, at play here. My guess is that if the affirmative reads an econ advantage, judges are more likely to believe the claim that the economy is going to decline in the status quo. If they don't read an econ advantage, and the 1 in C is the first one to talk about the economy, and the 2AC reads all the same cards that would have been read on their advantage, I still kind of think that the judge would think that the economy is not going to decline in the status quo. Uh, my way of saying this is like when the 1AC reads an econ advantage, I think it's far more likely that you need to specifically answer try or die slash decline is certainly inevitable. Okay? So the econ advantage in the 1AC, that's, that's not just the judge's fault. Like usually if it's in the 1AC, there's like stronger evidence and it's longer and more highlighted and more qualified that actually says decline is coming now. So my biggest concern, if I were coaching you before a debate against an econ advantage, my biggest concern would be you have to make sure that you win econ is high now, and that all of their kind of projected economic collapses that are coming in the SQUO are wrong. So that raises the burden for the NEG quite a bit. Okay, there were two more things I wanted to talk about, but 
Um, I'm basically just going to give you all, or give your lab leaders this set of slides, and then you can draw from them as, as you want. So, so you don't need to write all this stuff down now. This is kind of a set of research tips. So if you are starting to do econ research, these are uniqueness and link and internal link terms that you might want to use. And then I want to talk a little bit about the big myth before questions. So I mentioned early Naomi Oreskes. Uh, she's a professor of history at Harvard. Um, probably one of my favorite writers and public intellectuals of the moment. She has a new book, came out in February, called The Big Myth. And it basically describes the way that the economy um, and inequality in society structures the intellectual production in America. And what she means is basically think tanks, uh, a lot of them, are basically built by and for corporations. And then they end up holding quite a bit of power in American society. They shape government opinions. They're cited in... Um, congressional testimony. Um, they're oftentimes the ones that end up, you know, producing a job or producing the people that go on to work for. So, like, if you work at one of these places, you might be more likely to be picked up by a Republican on the Hill uh, to work as one of their chief economists. So, these places are not places that I usually like read for fun, but they do oftentimes have some pretty helpful negative evidence. So, the American Enterprise Institute, et cetera, are places that. You'll almost all of these, you'll find great taxes bad cards and deficit bad cards. Uh, there's a weird overlap on this topic where like a lot of these places actually do think like a basic income is a good idea and a job guarantee is a good idea. They're not as big on expanding social security. So these are places where I would just frequent if you know if you're a neg two in and you're doing the kind of like <coughs> impact tourney approach where it's like we think what's good for the boss is good for the person. We think inequality is okay because it solves poverty, et cetera. These are places that will likely produce the evidence that, um, that are consistent with that myth, but helpful for debate. Okay, we have a couple of minutes for questions, and then Zahir's going to take over. <laughs> okay, yeah, we can call it. Okay, you have to be back in your seats 